Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, and I'm here with the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. We have been tweeting and taking your questions uh, on social uh, with the hashtag AskTNMOC, and we've been posting furiously as well. One of, the, uh, one of our posts was, Steve Jobs invested $12 million in, in his next computer company that ultimately failed, but his next cube guaranteed its place in history by becoming the system that CERN's Tim Berners-Lee used to create the World Wide Web. Most, most people today, and they probably won't know what a next cube is. So we have one at the museum. It's worth finding out what, an, what a next cube is and maybe why TBL did use that system. I'm here with uh, Andrew Herbert, who's one of the uh, uh, expert guides and who works at the museum and who's also a former Microsoft Research Cambridge employee. Andrew, what is the next cube? Why did Tim Berners-Lee use this in particular, not a more famous brand of the time, such as the Dell that's even with today? Um, so it's kind of, it was, it been a bit early to be using a Dell. So the landscape at that time um, was dominated by um, what we called workstations made by companies like Sun and Prime and HP. Remember, Berners-Lee was at CERN, the nuclear research establishment. So all the people around him were doing scientific research and, and that needs quite powerful computers, um, doing simulations and so forth. Um, a typical workstation, therefore, was you know, a box the size of a sort of um, under-counter uh, <laughs> fridge. Yeah. Um, and then on your desk, you had a, um, a, a big graphical screen um, and a, a keyboard and a mouse. Um, over time, the processor boxes shrank and the next cube was indeed a cube, about a foot cubed, um, that could actually sit on your desk. They, they hadn't shrunk to the size yet of being inside the screen. Um, and these were high resolution screens so that you could display quite fancy graphics, um, which you might well want to do if you're trying to um, you know, display graphs of, of what's mm -hmm. going on in, in, um, in, in nuclear reactions and so forth. So the, in some ways, the, the next cube was the end of that line of development. Um, it was a very nice box, um, so it was seen as quite exciting technology from a hardware point of view. And Jobs invested a lot in the hardware. The earlier machines all ran versions of Unix that had kind of been inherited from the um, PDP-11 and, and VAX world. Um, and um, Jobs is uh, what Jobs kind of came up with a lot of object orientation um, in the programming languages he provided, in the way the graphical user interface could be programmed. And that was all very new and exciting at that point. Um, you know, people have seen what Xerox Park had done with things like mm -hmm. the Alto and so forth. Um, so um, if you're a science lab at that time and well-funded as CERN is, and you wanted a state-of-the-art workstation, you'd certainly have a, a next cube um, on your desk. Uh, and that's the background to you know, how Tim ended up using a next cube to do his early work on the web. Um, there were personal computers around at that time, and the IBM PC and the various derivatives of that by companies like Dell and so mm -hmm. forth. But at that point, they didn't have the, the horsepower to do the numerical calculations that a scientist might want. Um, the screens weren't high resolution graphics um, of the kind that <clears throat> scientists and engineers needed. Um, and frankly, you know, they, they weren't quite as reliable. They, they were seen as things for doing email and spreadsheets and so you know, they were for accountants and clerks. Um, obviously all that changed. Um, now you know, our, our PCs, our, our Apples, our, our, our so forth, our Macs, um, they do the job that the old workstations used to do. Mm. And in some sense the legacy is, is still there because um, though Next failed, um, Steve took a lot of the ideas and technology with him, including the operating system into Apple Mac OS is a derivative of, of the next operating system. And if you go to a scientific workshop today, um, you'll find an awful lot of scientists have a, a MacBook or a Mac workstation um, at home. Because again, it's, it's a powerful computer. It's got very good graphics. Um, and underneath it is you know, Unix, which is the popular operating system for doing scientific work. Yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was the new, the latest cool thing for the, the science hardcore science geeks at the time. Um, yeah. Gone from the mainstream of history, but it's, it's ghost still lives on in, in Mac OS today. Yeah, and with hindsight, you can kind of look at it as in some ways being the stepping stone 
from the, the workstations of the 1980s and 90s um, to the, the kind of um, you know, high-end personal computers, particularly the Apple Mac range that we have today. 